Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing marvelously well. I feel very privileged because I'm talking to somebody you'll all know as Buck Dharma. He is the lead singer, songwriter, and guitar player of a little band called Blue Oyster Cult. Absolutely incredible talking to you, Buck. Now, your real name is Don Rosa. So, Donald Rosa? Yes. I suppose the dumb question is, where did you come up with Buck Dharma? Early on in the in the BOC uh, germination, you know, uh, we all uh, considered pseudonyms. Ah, and of all the band, I was the only only guy that liked his. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yet at the same time, I wanted my real name on the record too. So uh, you know, so the kids from high school would know who it was. Where did you grow up? I'm from Long Island, uh, New York originally. You know, suburban boy. I met the what, the original drummer of what became Blue Oyster Cult in college. I went to a, a small engineering college upstate New York, Clarkson College, and that's now Clarkson University. And we had a bar band there. And uh, after dropping out of Clarkson, uh, uh, Albert and I went on to form the Soft One Underbelly, which evolved into Blue Oyster Cult. Where did you come up with the name Blue Oyster Cult? It was a song title. Um, Sandy Perlman, one of the first rock critics uh, in when the rock started to be written about seriously, he he wanted to be a an artist himself. He he couldn't sing or play, but he just knew <laughs> everything about music itself. I mean, he really conceived of of it, and he he wrote songs. He wrote lyric, and so he he heard me playing. In a in a in a uh, a house where uh, college students, um, you know, all stayed in you know, one of those houses where there's eight students sharing, you know, six bedrooms, that kind of thing, you know. So that was sort of the germ of what became the Soft White Underbelly, and then it became Blue Oyster Cult. It's such a timeless name in a world that we live now. All band names are these sort of juxtapositions of different ideas and stuff. So, yeah. Well, the Blue Oyster Cult in the in the song, as far as the song goes, was a race of uh, mi- uh, imaginary uh, amphibious beings that that lived along the shoreline, and they rescue a sailor who washed up on the f- shore and and uh, restore him to health. So, when you did the first album, the self titled first album, was that your first recording, like professional recording? Or no, uh, as the Soft White that? Underbelly, we had uh, signed to Electra Records. We did. Uh, Two rounds of recordings for Electra, and uh, eventually had fell out with the label, and the, the the recordings were never released. They came out on Rhino about thirty years after they were done. They're online; you can get them on the streaming services now. For you, is there a very obvious development from those first two albums into the self-titled album? The soft one underbelly was sort of we saw ourselves as the last of the uh, East Coast psychedelic bands. You know, we were very influenced by the Grateful Dead and the Airplane and and those bands, you know, Quicksilver. And so very much like a jam band, you know, uh, today's jam bands. The material was uh, very esoteric, very all over the place stylistically, as was Blue Oyster Cult. You know, we're not really. But that's the beauty of Blue Oyster Cult. And I think part of American 70s rock, a lot of it didn't translate abroad. It was very American, where Blue Oyster Cult did, because when you listen to Blue Oyster Cult, you hear so many different influences. You hear a lot of emphasis on melody and harmony. Yeah. Um, Less allegorical style American songwriting and really melodic. Were there any particular bands that you grew up listening to that influenced that? Um, We were very influenced by the uh, first uh, British invasion, you know, the the Beatles era, you know, Beatles, Stones, Searchers, uh, Hollies, you know, all those bands like that. And also American pop music, certainly, you know, Beach Boys and Four Seasons and and all the one hit wonders, you know, from that that era, you know. My first band as a guitar player was a surf band, you know, we, we didn't sing at all. You know, we just played the surf instrumental hits of the day. Tell me a little bit about this first album. You get signed again, right? Which is a, a huge deal. Yeah. So our our Electra uh, career fizzled, and uh, we went out as and played bars for about eight ten months just to survive, and we were getting discouraged and and ready to call it quits. And we got an audition with Clive Davis at Columbia. We were in a conference room, and Clive came in with Harry Nilsson and uh, Bobby Columbia from Blood, Sweat, and Tears. 
and they listened to uh, about five songs and it wasn't a very big room and of course you know i had a twin reverb you know <laughs> but but they sat there with their legs crossed and listened you know and uh at one point, uh, Harry gets up and leaves, and we should, and not, we were thinking to ourselves, "Ah, man, he doesn't like us," you know. But we talked yeah. to him later. He just had to have a cigarette. He said, "No, I liked you guys." <laughs> so anyway, Clive signs us, and uh, we do the first record. Credit-wise, it was uh, David Lucas. David Lucas was a New York uh, jingle writer producer, and oh, he wow. had, yeah, and he had a studio on on. Uh, 46th Street and 8th Avenue. He had the first eight track machine in New York City. He had a Scully eight track before when everybody else had, you know, Ampex four tracks. You know, so. Incredible. Yeah. So our first record was eight track. And uh, we met him at a gig we did that he was a, a spectator. He got involved with us and he co produced three of our records the first one and Agents and Spectres. Great building relationship with somebody who's actually a fan of the band. That's quite unique, actually, because. These days, you wouldn't expect uh, a record company to support that kind of producer. They would want to just throw you in with one of their guys that, you know, was a hit machine. Or yeah. Something. Well, that was the transition away from the, the studio machine, you know. I mean, I suppose we could have got Mitch Miller if we wanted to, but, you know, I don't think we wanted yeah. to. No. But uh, Sandy Perlman and, uh, and his partner at the time, uh, Murray Krugman, were the other co-producers, so. And uh, Sandy and Murray would produce uh, the first three records. And then uh, David was brought back for uh, Ages of Fortune and um, Spectres. Quite fortuitous, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it worked Ages out great. And we also huge, got right? to work with the, the great Shelly Akis, too, which was wonderful. What was it like, you know, when the Will Ferrell sketch came out and suddenly there was like this massive spotlight shining back on you? It must have been uh, quite an interesting thing, especially because they were highlighting a cowbell. Yeah. Well, it's funny. You can never see these things coming. You know? So so it was quite a surprise. I thought the sketch was hilarious. You know? I it saw is hilarious. about the last 10 seconds of it live because I wasn't watching, but the phone rang as soon as it started. So, But I saw it shortly thereafter, and I must have seen it about 30 or 40 times by now, and it's still great. <laughs> so when I was with Shelley, I really muddled through trying to play the riff of uh, Don't Fear the Reaper. And I think I completely messed it up. So I was going to ask you, how do you act? Yeah. And what is the instrumentation? Shelley and I were trying to figure it out, and he was trying to remember. Is there a harpsichord or something? By yeah, there's a clavinet. Alan Lanier doubled the line with a clavinet, and it's oh, and it doesn't, do, you know, it's not equal volume, but it's it's right under the guitar. It gives it an otherworldly kind of sound. It's so yeah, neat. It does, you know. And the clavinet's one of those instruments that's not really been successfully synthesized. Yeah, you know, it just doesn't sound quite like the original Horner clavinet. I've been waxing lyrically about your solo in that song for quite a few decades. It, the whole song just lifts around that. It, was, it, was it improvised? Did you write it? Is it a combination of something you've written and you improvised? How did you come up with that solo? Well, I wrote the bridge, you know, and the backing track of the bridge, and that's pretty much the same as it was on my original T-Act demo. The, the solo was improvised. And, really? And that one was gotten in one take. Now, I, wow. I, I'm, I don't do that all the time. I typically do a lot of takes and comp solos, you know, like after I heard that's the way Jeff Beck did it. So once I heard that, okay, well, then I'll do it that way. I won't try to do it all at once, you know. But that one went down at once. Well, we did rehearse it. You know, we, 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 uh, the band practiced the song for, yeah, for a while before we went into the studio. We didn't want to waste too much studio time. You know, we wanted to be prepared. Do you have a do you have a memory of 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 what guitar and amp and everything it was on it? The riff of the Reaper was recorded on a, a Gibson uh, ES one seventy five, blonde, Beautiful. you know, one of those jazz boxes that belonged to Murray Krugman. He says, "Why don't you use this on this record?" And it's got a unique sound. And the only downside is is that when I play it live, it never sounds quite like the record. You know, it's so it sounds like a different guitar. The lead was done on my SG which was a 68 SG. At that time, it had the stock pickups on it. Do you still have that guitar? 
No, the original one is gone. Uh, the Gibson Custom Shop made me a replica. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, but uh, I don't take that on the road. Yeah. I play uh, Steinberger's live mostly. So the other day I was, I was researching the song and I found you playing it live recently and you actually go up in key. We played it in B instead of A minor uh, yeah. for a long time, uh, mostly just to get the vocal to cut better. Hmm. And then uh, a few years ago, um, we did a, the 40th anniversary of Agents of Fortune. We put it back in the original key. Since we started using in-ear monitors, now we can hear ourselves and we can sing better. And we're softer on stage than we used to be. So that so the album getting to Agents of Fortune is incredibly eclectic. I mean, you've got horns all over it. You've got the the Brecker Brothers playing on it, which is yeah, incredible. Right, and that was another asset to have uh, David Lucas working because you know he dealt with all these great New York guys day in and day out as a as a, a jingle producer. So that worked well. So you have Murray Krugman, yeah, Sandy Perlman, and David Lucas. Producing. So with the three of them, how does that work with a dynamic? Uh, it was producing? pandemonium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, actually, it, it's good. I mean, everybody contributed ideas and, and you know, with the, they were, we tried pretty much every idea, you know, because like I said, it's, um, we were, we we're pretty open to uh, input. So the path became clear fast yeah there was there was there wasn't any uh, dictators or furors you know? that's great so so they were able to in the pandemonium like compromise and listen yeah, to yeah yeah you know i mean uh, david's biggest influence was what he is he was a really musical guy and murray and, and sandy were more the uh, the the conceptual guys you know the the vibe guys and then of course we had shelly you know who was getting it all on the tape and Who's, yeah, an absolute master. And I presume Shelley mixed it. Did you sit there with Shelley and mix it with him? Yep, yep. I've, I've heard your own stuff that you do and you produce and engineer and mix on your own. So I know you, you, you're you very talented in that area too. Right. Although at that time, I, I didn't know much about it. I mean, I had just gotten the, the TAC 3340S and that was my introduction really into recording. You know? Right. And you just had like a little setup at home that you were demoing for the album? Yeah, well, I had a 57 and I had a, I had this little Yamaha mixer and I went direct in with guitar. So the guitar sounds weren't much, but uh, that worked. It got the point across. Yeah. Would you mind um, playing the solo? Um, I never played a solo twice. I mean, I, I don't play the original solo. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like yeah. I remember it. You know, I, I mean, I know sort of where it is, but... Uh, S sort of where it is would still be very exciting Let's for everyone. Let's see, it's okay. <laughs> That's the back track. to the riff beautiful so when you were talking about coming from a 60s psychedelic background mm. there's definitely a lot of that in your solo that it's got a sort of indian influence mystical kind of way of playing but still with blues right i don't have any book learning in terms of music but i know that what it sounds like you know whatever that chord the scale is and you know interval you know it seems that the most successful artists I know have little or no technical knowledge. They all just play a, a combination of emotion and also just listening to what they're playing. I suppose you could come at it from both directions and it's great to have the background and the grounding. I've learned a lot over the decades, you know, about uh, the structure and theory of, uh, of music, but certainly not in that day. Right. 
when you were writing those incredible songs, yeah, you were just writing what came to ear. That's the first song I wrote on a tape recorder, a multi-track recorder. Before that, the band just got together in a room and basically hashed it out. We had a you know a stereo recorder that was couldn't overdub on it. You know? It feels so accomplished, though. You feel like the fact that you were able to demo it so completely before going in the studio is really what elevated it into that level? Multi-track recorders definitely changed the the sound of Blue Oyster Cult because everybody had one and everybody wrote and they were all bringing in songs that were a lot further along than had previously been the case, you know. And that's, you know, there's there's probably strengths and weaknesses about doing it that way, but that's that's the way it's done. Certainly today, it's the way it's done. In this instance, it definitely was a huge elevation. I wonder, because you had already done several albums before that, so you were so used to understanding each other as musicians. We were definitely a, a cooperative in the sense that uh, when when members would write a song, you know, we would all try to make it as good as possible, you know, and, and support the idea of the creator, you know, and not really even get too much into criticizing, you know, whether it was in your wheelhouse or not, you know. You do Agents of Fortune, you get international success from that. So was that immediately like touring like crazy? One great thing about the era and about Columbia Records is that our first record sold about 100,000 copies in the first year. Tyranny Mutation sold about 200,000 copies in the first, in the year that it was out. And <laughs> Columbia didn't drop us, you know, they... That we were working hard, touring hard, building up a live following, you know, getting better as a band, getting better as performers. And uh, they stuck with us. So the first gold record was uh, On Your Feet or On Your Knees, the fourth LP, which is the live LP. And, uh, and Agents was the first platinum and also the first single hit we had. You know, we'd been an album band exclusively before that. And so did you go straight on the road after this? In those days, we'd tour about nine months a year and uh, then come off and make a record and then go out again. It was uh, very strenuous. Yep. So they, so they, weren't, they didn't milk this for, for two years because um, you did Spectres like the next year. No, I mean, just about every band was expected to release a record a year. You know, that's basically right. maybe maybe every 14 or 16 months, you know. How was it going back into the studio after like such massive success? Was there incredible expectation? Yeah, a lot of pressure. I think everybody in the band wanted to write a hit. You know, that started happening <laughs> for better or worse. And uh, yeah, of course, everybody's got expectations. What are you going to do this time? You know? Godzilla was, was definitely a big follow-up hit. So it must have been great to come out with such an amazing song after having such a huge hit on the album. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's good. You 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 benefit a little from the momentum. And um, the next uh, single we had was uh, Burning For You, which is uh, on a record produced by Martin Birch in 1981. So there was a little bit of a spread there. Martin Birch, how did all that happen? The band wanted to work with some different producers you know, at the, after, after Spectres. We did a record with Tom Werman in uh, LA. The next time we wanted to work with Martin and Martin had just done the Heaven and Hell record for Black Sabbath. He was great to work with, you know, and he recorded and produced, you know, he was, he did everything. He taught me a lot about recording because, you know, I was curious and he was very free with his expertise. Yeah. Where did you record Burning For You? That was uh, that was recorded in a little studio on Long Island in the first the street level of uh, of a building that was uh, owned by the Harris Corporation, which is a big defense contractor. It's called <laughs> Kingdom Sound, and uh, yeah, that's where we did that. I think it was a Studer A eighty and and uh, and big red monitors, and uh, they had a Harrison console. So he came to you. Yeah, yeah, he did it in Long Island. Was the whole album done there? Yep. You know, I think we spent about 10 weeks doing it. Did he come down and do pre-production with you before you even went into the studio? We were pretty much ready for him when he was free, you know, and we just basically got to it. Fire of an Origin was the second record we'd done with Martin. We did the ah. Cultosaurus Erectus record with Martin first at the same studio. So we'd done Cultosaurus, which had no hits on it, but we loved that record. And, and it's it's one of our favorite records. And Working with Martin again was a you know a great great experience. Were you fans particularly of Heaven and Hell? Was there any one particular album that you were jumping? Yeah, I mean when you put Heaven and Hell on, just the sound of it is something you say. Yeah, I, I want that my record to sound like that, you know, or at yeah. least you know in the to have that kind of presentation that Martin brings to the you know, party. Going back to Fire of Origins, that is an 
incredible lineup of people working on the record. Was Sandy, uh, see, has got composer credit. Sandy was our probably a prim primary lyricist for, for a lot of our career, you know. I mean, he was still very much involved in what the band was, you know, and shaping the band's image and uh, working on the band's show and stuff, you know. He was uh, branching out at that point in time. He uh, produced a Clash record, Give Enough Rope. He saw some of the other career producers and wanted to, you know, emulate that rather than just being known for just BOC. He worked, uh, he worked with the Dictators, New York band. Them, yeah. yeah. And later on, he moved to uh, the Bay Area and uh, he was out there for the, basically the rest of his life. Getting back to the band's evolution, with the original lineup, how long did you go and when it came down to mainly you? Was there a particular moment you remember that happening? Was it just from touring and all the work that you're being put through by labels? Yeah, I, there's, you know, the usual pressures, you know, on, on rock bands, of the, especially of, at the time, you know, the 80s, led to Albert Bouchard's departure from the band. And then his brother Joe left in 85. Then we went through... Uh, a, a cycle of uh, other musicians in the band, Eric and I being the, the, the really stable part. And Alan Lanier, uh, Alan passed away in uh, 12, no, yeah, 12, 2012. Richie Castellano uh, uh, became uh, the Alan Lanier of the band. And uh, to this day is now a really important part of the band. And uh, it's, it's always been Eric and I. And uh, the current band is actually been together longer than the original band so right <laughs> yeah jules rodino our drummer has been in the band 16 years now and uh, danny miranda the bassist was with us in the 90s and then he got an opportunity to play the the queen uh broadway show in las vegas and then and then brian may drafted him for the tour that they did with paul rogers the worldwide tour so he was in queen for Incredible. two years and then he uh, played with Meatloaf for, I don't know how many years before Meatloaf retired and he joined us again. You had just put out a new record, I think, when we first started talking. Yeah, it's called The Symbol Remains. It came out right at the end of 2020. We, we, had, we did the basic tracks right before the COVID lockdowns. And then we had to finish the record at home, which we did. And uh, fortunately, the technologies of Zoom type uh, calls and uh, everybody's got their own DAWs and you could just uh, we could sort of produce each other not not in absolute real time there's latency involved but you could definitely look over your somebody's shoulder and talk about it so that's the way we did it you sent me a, a song to listen to that you've been working on recently is that for a new album that's something I'm doing for myself and okay. uh, it's funny since I talked to you I played that for Shelly and Shelly gave me some uh, some some strong advice, and he's offered to to help me uh, see it through. So I think I'm going to take him up on that. Oh, that's wonderful! I'm glad that you guys have reconnected and and, and be able to work together. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. The harmony part, the guitar hook in "Burning for You." Can I can I lean on you to 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 play that back? I would love to know how to play that properly. The uh, uh, that was obviously uh, overdubbed in the studio, but uh, there's two parts. It's the, the chord. Yeah, I don't play that one, so that's why that was a little rough. <laughs> and if you play them together, it goes. Nice. Home in the Valley. I don't think I can go a day driving to and from the studio without hearing that at least three times on classic rock radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just hope that, you know, you never get tired of it. You know, some songs they play so often, you just, they, they just wear out their welcome. But I don't, that's not really the case with Blois. You're big on the melodies. You've got this kind of mysticism with your name, with Dharma, the fact that you came from the late 60s and the psychedelic music being really where you started. And you were saying like a jam band kind of influence. You've got this very rock guitar style as well, mixed in with all of this beautiful harmony work. I think it makes you incredibly unique. And when you talk about why people aren't tired of your songs, it's because it's not one dimensional, because there's so many layers. Yeah. But I do have to ask you about the lyrics, because there's a lot of interpretation on Don't Fear the Reaper. It's basically a love story that, that 
survives the death of, of one of the lovers. You know, a guy is what happens, you know, and that was the idea came to me because I'd been diagnosed with a, a uh, heart arrhythmia. Was worried about it. I was, you know, in my low 20s and turned out not to be uh, life threatening. So, but it got me thinking, you know, about that idea. I wanted to write a song that posited that there was something else out there after death, you know, not that there was, you know, go up to the clouds and uh, got a harp and a, and a halo, but, uh, but there was something else. There was another plane of existence. So that's the story. I wrote the riff on the four track recorder and um, the first two lines of the lyric came into my head. And then it took me about six weeks to finish the story. Now, obviously, the the suicide stuff comes from the Romeo and Juliet reference, which, you know, to me just meant, well, there's that, that was a success. I mean, I, I imagine that they got somewhere, you know, so. But it wasn't specifically about suicide. There's just that. No, no, it wasn't. Yeah. In fact, you know, in the story, it's not like anything happens except that this bridge between the two planes opens up, you know. And the girl rejoins the guy, you know, and they just go to where to the other place, you know. So right. how they get there and what happens is not is not really you know, explained. It's the whole package, isn't it? Because you've got this like searing rock guitar solo, you've got this super hooky riff that grabs you right immediately. That every kid I remember was trying to learn and play, and still does. Then you've got this like ultra melodic and beautiful vocal line where it's just. It's pretty. It's beautiful, which makes it even more jarring because the lyrics are so obviously about death. I was trying to sell the story, basically. Yeah, yeah. and the bridge is is the musical uh, version of the you know the two universes coming together. You know, that's the idea. That during that bridge, that's when that's when the the, the weird stuff happens. You know? So many dimensions. That's why it's such a, a long-lasting song that just keeps getting every single generation is discovering it. I, you know, I'm not tired of it yet. I don't think the band is either. It's just, it's good to have a hit that you're not, you don't get sick of playing because you have to play it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think with all of those musical influences that you've got and the way that there's so many ideas in the song, yeah. I'm sure it keeps it interesting and you can explore. And like you said, that you do a version of the solo and you get to improvise it differently every single night. I mean, we do that for everything. You know, we, we really need to entertain ourselves. I, I couldn't play, you know, the LP every night. It would just... I would get bored. Yeah, BOC Live is is very dynamic and very and very uh, in the moment. You know, we have to be, and that's that's the way we do it. You know, it, it's never terrible, but on some nights, you know, you really you really feel like you're just surfing the edge of the wave. You know, and and, and you, you're getting the whole audience in there with it. You know, and those nights are just magic. I think another thing is growing up in the UK. I always assumed you were West Coast because of the big harmonies and stuff, and because of the psychedelic elements. So I just I just assumed you were a West Coast American rock band. Now that it's sort of all coming and making sense to me is you had the best parts of the American West Coast sound with the big harmonies and, and the beautiful kind of arrangements. But you had this darker kind of sinister edge and musicality. The Doors were a big influence on us. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, speaking of just, you know, the sort of that, the, that mysterious thing, you know, uh, Robbie Krieger is a big influence on my playing. You know, I think I played an SG because he played an SG, you know. Right. Carlos Santana, he started on an SG too. So as far as songwriting, you know, we were a big fan of The Doors and uh, certainly we wanted to emulate a little of what they had. I always say you can be pure pop and you can be like prog, experimental, crazy. And actually the extremes are much easier to do than what happens with you guys. And that's that little tiny crossover moment where you can have the experimentation, you can have the artistry and also have enough pop that it connects to a whole new generation. Yeah. Well, and we were definitely the product of, of our personalities and our influences. And, uh, and we never took ourselves too seriously either. Right. You know, we would, you know, do stuff just for the humor of it. You know? Do you still talk to the other guys from back in the original lineup? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, we're doing a 50th year uh, three-day stand in New York City in uh, September, and Albert Bouchard is joining us for that. So, 
and we've got a, a European tour in uh, October. We're doing some arenas in the UK with Deep Purple, which we've been trying to do for two years, but uh, COVID has postponed it. We're finally going to get to do it. Then nice. we've got some uh, continent dates. We've got a couple of days in Paris, and we're probably going to film those in uh, Belgium, and then uh, then back to the US. Congratulations on going so strong, and congratulations on just the fact that people just keep rediscovering your music. It's been beautiful to see and hear. I never thought I'd be doing it for 50 years. I always thought I'd make a couple of records and then do something else for a living, you know, but here, here I am. You know? I think of that interview that the Beatles gave in like 63 or something. They asked them what they wanted to do after their music career. What was Ringo's answer? I can't remember. Was it like open a shoe shop or something? <laughs> I can't remember what it was. It was something like that. Yeah. Not everybody assumes that you have a hit or something and you're going to be, that's it. You're right. Going to be. I probably, you know, I mean, if, if the BOC had failed, I, I think I really wanted to, you know, join a recording studio or something. I, that's, I would have given that a shot. Become an engineer and then eventually a producer. Yeah, just take take what I not, you know, learned about it and run with it. And, you know. Well, that makes sense. Um, you know, especially learning now how you produced your own demo for Don't Fear the Reaper and were able to come into the studio and really like elevate it. And that was such a, a huge moment. Right. It still resonates with us all now. Well, I think you know, once multi-track happened, you know, you know, I think everybody worked that way, right? You know, they, everybody did demos and I, you know, I admired Stevie Wonder like crazy, you know, for oh, yeah. playing all the instruments and, you know, he had help recording, but, you know, he basically was all him and Todd Rundgren, of course, guys like him that just did everything and, you know, Tom Scholz, you know, making that, that amazing Boston record, you know. It's like an extension of your soul because you've got the song, you've got your vision, and now you can put it down. The 50th year of BOC is um, it's going to be the last big push, I think, you know, as far as the bands uh, being out there in front of people. Going forward, we'll, we'll probably do something, but it's definitely not going to be like it was for the last four and a half decades. So 2022, that's it. Don, thank you ever so much. I really appreciate it. This has been a, a lot of fun. I think we entertained ourselves. I hope we can entertain your audience. I'm sure they'll be very, very happy to hear all of this stuff. And thanks for clearing up some of the backgrounds about the song, because there's been so much for, for Reaper. There's so much online chatter as to what it's about. You know, it's we've always thought cinematically, you know, about about songs, like, you know, like movies playing in our heads. Like I said, we never took ourselves too seriously. You know, we would like to tell stories. I like I like bands that tell stories. You know, uh, artists that do that. You know, rather than just like a like a personal narrative that that could be good, but it's I prefer actually a yarn. You know, and let people interpret it the way they want to, so they can apply their own meaning. Because they will, they will yeah. interpret it the way they want to, which they certainly have. Yeah. 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 So if you, you know, if you, if you leave, leave some blank spaces or, or, you know, open interpretations, you, you know, sometimes what the, what the listener thinks is, is more interesting than what you intended. I can completely relate to that. That makes absolutely perfect sense. Thanks ever so much. I really appreciate it, Don. This has been wonderful. Truly, truly wonderful. Yeah. Maybe next year I'll see you at NAM. Yeah, that will be fun. Adios until then, right? Yep. Sounds great. I really appreciate it, Don. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.